So, okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome at our fifth uh, Eximius Symposium. So, um, the Symposium on Risk Assessment uh, of Mixed Exposures, different issues, particles, carcinogens, and a little bit on uh, EU policy. So, I'm Peter Hood. I try to host you a little bit on this and give short introduction on how this will uh, emerge, and then uh, I will give certainly the most important the speakers time to have their uh, say. So first, some housekeeping issues. So for your information, this event is being recorded, eh? and it will be shared afterwards at the Eximius website, uh, as far as is possible. Eh? Uh, and then you can re-look at this uh, when needed, or you can advise someone uh, when you think it's very interesting to have a look at this um, event. Uh, that have, having said that, and, and all the rules um, on privacy uh, to respect, uh, if you have an intervention and you don't want that intervention being uh, at the recording, please let us know via uh, the link here, info at exenius.eu. One other thing to have a smooth way of uh, having your questions and when, if there are any technical issues, uh, how, how to act, if possible, when there is a technical issue, then um, please notify that in the chat uh, of the Zoom uh, application. So as indicated here uh, with the arrows, uh, then uh, the people supporting this symposium, and that is then uh, Wei Wei and Emanosic uh, looking at uh, and, and trying to keep things going as, as good as possible. Uh, so then they are informed. And at the other hand, when you have a scientific question concerning the topic uh, for one of the speakers, and, and the question comes to you during the talk, please note it down. Then after the talk, uh, we can pick the questions and uh, pose them to the speakers. So just a very brief introduction. Probably most of you uh, know um, Eximius and the Eximius project which is a larger exposome a cohort study uh, in which we try to assess uh, the human exposome, linking it to uh, the immunome and the association between immune responses, immune-related diseases, and human exposure. And uh, this is a EU-funded project, uh, Horizon 2020. It is running until the end of next year, 24. Uh, we have a large budget, as you can see, and uh, we are also a lot of partners uh, bringing together a lot of different cohorts uh, in an in-depth study, the exposome, immunome, genome-wide uh, assays to be applied and to be analyzed. This project, Eximius, is a part of different uh, or grouped, in fact, in a, in a European Human Exposome Network, uh, which are, is a container with nine different uh, exposome projects funded by Horizon 2020. Uh, and these different exposome projects have somewhat different teams uh, they look at. Uh, we are looking at immune-mediated diseases. There are others, they look more at occupational uh, health, uh, others looking more to um, uh, chronic diseases, the, uh, and the urban environment, how it influences the health of people, and also some projects more concentrated on um, the large data bases, and, and new tools to analyze and, and interpret uh, the 
health and environment uh, studies. So, as I said, this is the fifth um, Eximia Symposium. Uh, you can see the four former ones uh, going from an introduction uh, over uh, what are now immune mediated disorders uh, to uh, penetration of, of uh, chemicals on the skin, uh, uh, an important route of exposure, and what is uh, the difference in age doing uh, on our immune health. And so today it is the team uh, is risk assessment of mixed exposures, which is also complex and typical exposome issue and having more than just one chemical um, as an exposure. And here we concentrate a little bit on, on particles, carcinogens, and on the EU policy on this, because it is also a relatively new field uh, to look at. And so the different speakers and the different titles are grouped here. Uh, I will introduce them one by one, uh, but just uh, to have an overview on, on the time. Uh, so, so from a little bit early, but maybe that is not bad uh, because Often it's difficult to keep track of full time uh, and at six o'clock we will be quite exhausted. So first we have a presentation on particle induced acute phase responses, then risk assessment of combined uh, occupational exposures, and then uh, this view on reach, uh, the policy and toxicological challenges. And so I may now introduce the first speaker, uh, uh, Professor Ulla Vogel from the National Research Center of the Working Environment of Sweden. Uh, and Denmark. Her... Sorry? Denmark. Denmark, yes. I was thinking when I was reading it. Yeah. It's, uh, I only know it now. Uh, sorry. No. Denmark. Um, and the, her domain of interest is adverse health effects of inhaled particles in relation to cancer and cardiovascular diseases. And as I said, so she's linked to the National Research Center in Denmark, uh, also linked to the DTU National Food Institute, and uh, she has an honorary doctorate uh, at Lund University. So I will step out, stop my sharing, and then uh, Ulla, please uh, take over. Thank you so much. And I will start sharing my screen. And... Um... So can you confirm whether you see uh, the presentation mode? Yes, I don't see presentation. I see your presentation, but not in presentation mode. Uh oh, yeah. And then I, now I have to switch screens, right? Yeah. So now we're good? Now you're full good. Thank you. So thank you so much for, for this opportunity to present um, <clears throat> for, for the Eximius project in, in, uh, in the Eximius seminars. Um, and as Peter said, my name is Ulla Vogel, and uh, I will talk about uh, particle-induced acute phase response as a causal link between inhalation of particles and cardiovascular disease. And I will try to convince you that this is a general mechanism for inhalation of, in principle, all particles. So this can be a link between the particulome and cardiovascular disease. Um, <clears throat> So we know from air pollution research uh, that was done in the early 90s and uh, that, that uh, there is a strong association between particulate air pollution and mortality and morbidity, uh, including cardiovascular disease. And this started with the famous epidemiological studies by Pope and Duggery, who showed that uh, there was this, that, that there was a strong um, association between exposure to particulate air pollution in the form of uh, PM 2.5, so uh, particles that are less than 2.5 micrometers in diameter, and the relative death rate. Uh, the first study was done in six cities, of including 8,000 people, but these findings were repeated in 150 urban areas with half a million people. So this clearly indicates that um, Inhalation of particles will increase uh, death rate and um, cardiovascular disease. When we uh, look at inhalation of particles, 
uh, size is very important and it is not the size of the primary particle, it's the size of the particle aggregate because particles will aggregate in air. And the smaller the particles are, the more they will aggregate in air. And this is seen in this diagram um, to the right where we have particles diameter on the x-axis and um, the number of particles on the y-axis. And uh, titanium dioxide ultrafine particles are particles that have a diameter of 20 uh, nanometers, but you can see that the majority of the particles aggregate uh, in uh, aggregates that are approximately 200 nanometers in diameter and also a peak at uh, one micrometer in diameter. And this is compared to when we have larger particles, they will primarily form lar larger aggregates, also shown here as titanium, uh, as a titanium pigment, which are micrometer sized and which form micrometer sized uh, aggregates. So this will influence the um, alveolar deposition or the deposition in the lung, which is shown in the next diagram here, again with particle size on the x-axis and deposition rate on the y-axis. And here you can see that the larger particles, those are that are micrometer sized, they will primarily deposit in the upper airways and in the, the head region and the thoracic uh, region, uh, whereas the nano sized uh, particles or will primarily deposit in the alveolar region. And this has a, a tremendous impact on the health effects. Um, and this is shown on next slide here where we zoom in to the alveoles. So again, the fine particles, the micrometer size, they will primarily deposit in the upper airways where we have the mucocellular uh, escalator, the, the fine hairs and the lung surfactant that will transport the particles up into the throat um, and clear away the particles within 24 hours. The few particles that will reach the alveoles will be engulfed by macrophages and removed from the lung. So clearance here is rather fast. On the other hand, if we have ultrafine particles or nanoparticles, a larger fraction of them will reach uh, the alveoles <clears throat> and um, they will overwhelm the, the, the macrophage clearance. So this will be Cinderella picking peas in the ashes, whereas in the situation with the fine uh, particles, Cinderella had to remove one football. So of course, um, picking the peas take longer time. So this will result in particle presence in the lungs for a longer time. And this will initiate the recognition of foreign bodies in the lung initiating inflammation, uh, recruitment of inflammatory cells and inflammatory mediators, uh, and generation of reactive oxygen species. And this is uh, the origin of much of the disease we see related to inhalation of particles. Just as an example of this uh, particle um, or prolonged particle clearance, uh, this is one of the very first studies that we did on um, nano-sized particles, and here, Mice inhaled uh, the white pigment titanium dioxide for one hour daily for 11 days. The dose that they got was half of the dose that Danish workers are allowed to inhale. Um, <clears throat> and then we measured the uh, deposited particles or the lung burden of titanium five days after end of exposure. And at that time point, we could find 24% of the deposited dose in the lungs. So clearance was not uh, ended uh, or was the particles were not completely cleared away five days after exposure. We measured also 25 days after exposure. And at this time point, 21% was still remaining in the lungs. So this illustrates the fact that um, inhalation of, of, of uh, nano-sized particles will lead to this alveolar deposition that leads to pro prolonged retention in the lung. And so what is the health effect of this? And this we also looked into. And here we show, um, we flush the lungs of the mice, and then we looked at the number and composition of the cells in the lungs of mice. And we looked for macrophages, which are the, the um, cell type that removes um, 
cells from the lung, and then we looked at neutrophils and, and lymphocytes, which are inflammatory cells. So the white bars illustrate mice that, il that inhaled clean air, and the hatch bars are mice that inhaled titanium dioxide. And what you can see is that the number of neutrophils and lymphocytes were increased in um, mice that inhaled titanium dioxide. So this uh, shows an inflammatory response. And we also saw that four weeks after inhalation, we still had an, an inflammatory response. So inhalation of the particles will induce prolonged particle presence, which induces inflammation. We now know that inflammation is predicted by the total surface area of the pulmonary deposited particles. Um, <clears throat> and this was shown, um, one of the first to show that was Ken Donaldson's group in Edinburgh, who instilled uh, styrene beads of different sizes into lungs of rats and showed that when they normalized, when they showed inflammation as function of mass, they saw no correlation. But when inflammation was um, <clears throat> expressed as function of the deposited surface area, they saw a very nice linear correlation. And we have also shown the same to be the case when we looked at carbon nanotubes and other particles. And um, we recently shown, showed that, that the inflammation uh, expressed as percent neutrophils of the total uh, cells in the, in the lung fl fluid uh, is predicted by the surface area of the, the retained particles across a number of particle types, uh, doses, and post-exposure time points in rats. Uh, so these uh, data here represent uh, time points uh, between uh, one day and uh, I think four weeks or nine weeks. So, um, so surface area is, is a very strong predictor of uh, inflammation. In order to understand this uh, inflammatory response in uh, more detail, we looked at the global gene expression uh, of lungs of mice that had inhaled the titanium dioxide. And to our huge surprise, we found that the strongest response was not the inflammatory response, it was in fact the acute phase response. And the most differentially regulated genes were two isoforms of the acute phase uh, protein serum amyloid A. Um, <clears throat> and this really got our attention because acute phase response is causally linked to cardiovascular disease. So the acute phase response is by definition, uh, the systemic response to acute and chronic inflammatory states that can be caused by a variety of different factors, a bacteria infection, virus, trauma or infarction or HIV infection, asthma, air pollution, um, a lot of different things. Um, and what it looks like is that you measure serum blood levels of different proteins um, and the two most differentially regulated acute phase proteins are CRP, C-reactive protein, and SAA, serum amyloid A. And CRP is used in the clinic as a marker of uh, systemic um, inflammation. And if it's extremely high, as in this example, you'll probably have a, a, a bacterial infection. And if it's a bit lower, it's a virus infection lower in, then it may be a chronic uh, infection. All the conditions that entail acute phase response are associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, and more specifically, the acute phase protein serum amyloid A is directly implicated in atherosclerosis, so plaque formation. And this is shown here, where uh, to the Right, there is a, this um, in vitro result showing that, that if you incubate um, macrophages with SAA, then they will uh, import cholesterol and become foam cells. And then in, <clears throat> in vivo, foam cells will deposit in the aorta and form atherosclerotic plaques. And um, This is shown in this slide. Where, so mice have three different iso, uh, inducible isoforms of serum amyloid A. 
And if you overexpress either SAA3 or SAA1, then you get increased plaque formation. And if you inactivate all three isoforms, you get decreased plaque formation. So SAA places causal role in, in, uh, in formation of aortic plaques. Acute phase protein CRP and SAA, they are usually highly correlated. And in prospective epidemiological studies, <clears throat> they are uh, associated with so future risk of cardiovascular disease. And this is an example from the nurses health study uh, where 120,000 nurses were enrolled and donated a blood sample at study entry. And then <clears throat> the blood levels of serum amyloid A and CRP were correlated to uh, cardiovascular events during 15 years of follow-up. And here it is shown that a five-fold increase in, in CRP levels are associated with a three-fold increased risk of cardiovascular disease. This is the same magnitude, a three-fold increased risk as you get from being a smoker. So this is a very strong effect. So we have proposed a mechanism of action for particle-induced atherosclerosis that in principle is valid for all types of particles. So in this model, uh, inhalation of particles will res result in inflammation and acute phase response in the lung that will lead to systemic circulation of acute phase proteins. And this systemic circulation will cause a formation of foam cells and plaques. And whenever there is a plaque disruption, you will have a, a, a cardiac event. And the diagnosis will differ from whether if, it's a, if the plaque is stuck in the brain, it will be a apoplexia. If it's in the heart, it will have another diagnosis. And if it's in another part of the body, it will have a third diagnosis. This pathway has been submitted as an AOP, um, and this is shown here. And so you will have the same uh, key events, but in a, described in a slightly different way. So the molecular initiating event will be substance interaction with lung resident cells membrane components, leading to increased secretion of pro-inflammatory mediators that in turn will uh, induce transcription of acute phase response protein that will be released into systemic um, circulation, leading to a systemic acute phase response that will cause formation of foam cells and lead to atherosclerosis. In mice, we see a dose-dependent induction of acute phase response in response to pulmonary deposition of different nanoparticles. And we see the dose dependence in two ways, both in terms of the number of differentially regulated acute phase response genes that we can see. Um, <clears throat> mice have uh, 50 acute phase proteins, uh, human have a little less, but we can count the number of differentially regulated acute phase proteins and we can also see the dose response in terms of fold increase of the most differentially regulated acute phase response gene, which is SAA3. Um, so we see this dose response dependent induction of acute phase re uh, response in mice for all the materials, nanomaterials that we have assessed so far, so more than 100. And mice and humans share an acute phase protein, uh, response, including um, expression of serum amyloid A, whereas rats have a fundamentally different acute phase response and do not express SAA. So um, in mice, we see a very close correlation between uh, neutrophils in the lungs and um, mRNA levels of, of um, SAA3 shown in, the, in, in panel A, or uh, neutrophils in the lung and the blood levels of SAA protein, or, um, and I could say, uh, 
SAA3 mRNA levels and SAA3 blood levels. And this means that these three can be used as biomarkers or proxies of each other. And this is very convenient because neutrophil influx is typically available in, in animal studies. Uh, and you can say that the mRNA le levels will always reveal the origin, the organ of origin uh, in, in animal studies. And this can help to reveal the causal pathway of the acute phase response that you observe. Whereas blood plasma or serum levels of CRP and SAA are typically available from, from human studies. So if you want to make a, a risk assessment here, we would say that um, for insoluble particles, including nanoparticles and ultrafine particles, uh, the acute phase response and the inflammatory response is proportional to the deposited surface area. So if particle size goes 10 times down, or if you compare, then um, if you compare two particles where one is 10 times smaller than the other, then there'll be a thousand or 10 to the third. So a thousand more particles per mass unit and the deposited surface area of the smaller particles will be 10 times larger per, ma per mass unit. And then if you look at how this will increase um, the acute phase response, then this also will increase a 10, 10 times and lead to 10 times higher risk of cardiovascular disease. We also, in humans, we also see a, a dose depend or a, a, a dose depend and acute phase response. This is, a, this has been mostly shown in controlled human studies. This is a, a study where volunteers were exposed to welding fumes containing zinc oxide and copper oxide. These are two soluble, rapidly soluble metal oxides, and they are known to induce metal fume fever. And, um, and here we can see that metal fume fever symptoms do not occur in this study, but we do see a systemic acute phase response. Uh, they also showed that the acute phase response uh, was with a dose dependence uh, in humans for where the, the dose was a cumulative dose, the daily dose calculated as concentration times uh, time, which means that this can be used for risk assessment like um, we do for animals. And specifically for zinc oxide, there is actually also uh, a, do, uh, a controlled human study showing dose-dependent acute phase response in human volunteers. And this is shown here, where uh, 16 volunteers were exposed to different concentrations of zinc, zinc oxide. All these concentrations were way below the current uh, occupational exposure limit for zinc in many countries uh, in, and in Denmark. Here it's, it's five milligram per cubic meter. Um, and this is the same in many countries. And here we could see that we got um, dose dependent induction of acute phase response and the no effect level was 0.5 milligram per cubic meter. So 10 times below uh, the OEL. Um, and based on this, um, we uh, warned it that the occupational exposure limits for metal oxides, including zinc oxide should be re-evaluated because clearly here, uh, exposure to zinc oxide at the OEL would induce a very strong acute phase response, which is causally linked to cardiovascular disease. For soluble, um, rapidly soluble metals such as zinc and copper, mass, not surface area, predicts the acute phase response. And this was very nicely demonstrated in, in, in a study by uh, Christian Munsey, so the same group who did the control study, and they showed that micro-sized titanium dioxide and nano-titanium ti dioxide uh, induced almost the same uh, acute phase response in volunteers um, and at very similar alveolar dosing, whereas um, the deposited surface area was very different for the two. So as uh, 
inhaled zinc will go into dissolution within 20 minutes or half an hour. So therefore, particle size does not matter here, but this is mass. Whereas for insoluble particles, it is a, a surface area, which is the best uh, predictor. Based on this, we were asked by the Danish Working Environment Authority to make documentation for health-based occupational exposure limit for zinc oxide based, and we base this on induction of acute phase response. And this is freely available on the uh, NFA homepage. Uh, <clears throat> and the, um, we based it on the no effect level observed in the control study. Then we normalized uh, to an eight hour working day and used the standard assessment factor for inter individual variation of five. Um, and then ended at 0 0.05 milligram per cubic meter zinc oxide. So 100 fold below the current Danish occupational exposure limit. We also have done uh, animal studies. So here we can actually also compare the, the knowledge that we have the, uh, from the human study and that we have derived from animal studies. And um, <clears throat> in, the, in the mice, um, the knoll was between 0 0.035 and 0 0.1, depending on what you use. Whereas in humans, it was um, 0 0.017 to 0 0.027. So you can say that these are actually within the same order of magnitude, surprisingly similar. Similar. Um, there are actually a number of studies um, in humans showing um, those response relationship between different exposures and acute phase response. So I just want to highlight this study to the left where um, healthy volunteers were exposed to different concentrations of wood smoke for two hours and acute phase response were uh, including increased levels of CRP and SAA uh, were observed uh, at um, at the highest concentration. So the no effect level was 0 0.24 milligram per cubic hour for two hours, corresponding to so 0 0.06 milligram uh, per hour per cubic meter for an eight hour working day. So in the same kind of um, order of magnitude as the zinc oxide derived um, OEL. And similarly, there is also a study looking at PM 2.5, where 40 microgram per cubic meter was enough to induce uh, significantly increased levels of CRP and SAA. There's also here a study um, showing that when you go at almost population level, you still find associations between PM 2.5 and CRP. And this is a study from Taiwan where um, CRP levels were measured in 30,000 Taiwanese, and these levels were correlated to air pollution um, measured by satellite. And here they found that for every five micrometer per cubic meter increment, um, <clears throat> CRP levels increased 1.4%. Um, so this shows that even in the, the range of the no effect level, you still see uh, those response relationship when you have large enough populations. Yeah. So in summary here, I would say that um, pulmonary deposition of many different particles induces inflammation and acute phase response in a dose dependent manner. And acute phase response protein serum amyloid A is causally related to cardiovascular disease. The retained particle surface area is predictive of the inflammatory and acute phase response of insoluble materials, whereas mass may be a better, better predictor for the acute phase response for highly soluble particles. Um, inhalation of particles is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, which makes cardiovascular disease a preventable particle-induced occupational disease. Um, and furthermore, Particle-induced acute phase response may be used as a basis for health-based exposure limits for different particles. There is a huge preventive potential here. Um, 
And there is evidence that reduction of particle exposure will reduce cardiovascular mortality. My best example is this um, natural intervention study where uh, heating with coal in private households was banned in Dublin Island in, in 91 to reduce the level of, of black smoke. And you can see to the right that the intervention was highly effective. Um, the black smoke uh, con air concentrations were reduced by 40 micrograms per cubic meter. In parallel with that, mortality rates were re reduced by 75 per 10,000 uh, or 100,000 man years, <clears throat> uh, measured over a five year window here before and after the ban. Um, this, this intervention was only done in Dublin, so the effects were adjusted for death rates in the rest of Ireland, making this a very strong study. If you look at the causes of death here, then uh, almost 80% of the prevented death were cardiovascular. And if you look at the age distribution, uh, half of the mortality causalities were below 60 years of age and half of them were older. So this just illustrates this very large uh, preventive potential. And with this, I will thank you for your attention and take questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ulla. Um, Can I stop sharing or? Yeah, you may stop and then I um, try to put my slides on again. But in the meanwhile, uh, I maybe read uh, already, there are two questions in, in the chat. So first question from Francois Yo, uh, what about the blood circulation of nanoparticles instead of SS, SAA? to explain uh, article sclerosis. Yes, so uh, for that, uh, Tobias Stöger has actually made some very nice studies uh, comparing uh, or trying to dose um, mice IV with, with the dose that, that, um, that he, he um, uh, that you could um, calculate what would translocate and finding very little effect of the particles uh, as compared to when you have a pulmonary deposition and the translocation. So the presence of the particles in, in the IV as an isolated, it did not seem really to, to induce the effects that we were looking for. Okay. And then <clears throat> a question of Steven Verpalen. Did I understand correctly that when particles are soluble, mass is the driver, not surface area? That's also what I understood. It is strange that this was shown with zinc oxide, which is not very soluble following so, Steven. So zinc oxide is not very soluble in water, but when zinc oxide uh, are engulfed by macrophages, they are internalized in lysosomes where the pH is low. And then they are actually go, they will go into dissolution very fast. And, and they will have gone into dissolution with, I think they are almost, completely disappeared within 20 minutes in the studies that I have seen. So uh, it is true that when they are in the lung, they will not, but they are engulfed by the macrophages and other cells. Okay. And then a question of uh, Yamini. Uh, you mentioned the particle-induced cardiovascular effect. I was wondering how you were able to distinguish the zinc oxide effect as related to the metal species and not the particle effect. So um, um, it's possible that part of the part of the uh, acute phase response here is related to the to the species, as you can say that that uh, the dissolution is an exothermic process, and we know that this will induce tissue injury. Uh, but we can, you know, it's very um, metal fume fever is is described for many particles both some that are highly soluble as zinc and copper and some that are not, not soluble. Uh, I think there are 30 different particles that are listed if you just Google uh, metal fume fever. Uh, and now we can see, you know, metal fume fever is just uh, described as influenza-like symptoms and then that you recover and then everything is good. But we, now we know that it's actually, this influenza is accompanied or preceded by acute phase response which then will give you cardiovascular disease, not 
the same day where you have the influenza, but in 20 years time. Okay. So I think that the that there will be a for, for the so highly solubles, they are very potent in inducing acute phase response. And then on the other hand, the acute phase response disappears within a few days, whereas the insoluble will give a lower acute phase response, but that will last as long as the, the particles are retained in the lung. So they will just be a, a lower response for, for a longer time. And perhaps the area under the curve is quite similar. Okay, thank you. And then uh, Ricardo asks, thank you for your presentation. It is known or hypothesized if acute uh, response to fine ultrafine particles are driven or extra ex exacerbated by individual genetic susceptibility. Yeah, I think that there, uh, uh, at least there are a lot of additive effects that if you have other conditions that will give you a higher baseline um, of, uh, of acute, so acute phase response, there's a lot of inter individual variation on your basal level of acute phase response that will uh, depend on uh, absence or presence of chronic uh, inflammatory diseases, could be COPD, could be asthma, could be bronchitis, could be a lot of different things. Then uh, physical activity will lower acute phase response, smoking will increase it, and then you just add on a lot of different factors that will modify it, which makes it, it, it a tricky um, a tricky biomarker for your individual particle exposure, but it works very well at, at the population level, as you could see with the example from Taiwan with 30,000 people, uh, where you saw the correlation across everything. Yeah, and then uh, two questions from, from uh, Birgit. Uh, so very interesting talk. Can you say which lung cells so lung cell types uh, produce acute phase proteins. Do liver contribute um, in this uh, and levels of APP in response to particle pollution? So can you say which cell types produce APPs and whether liver is a major contributor? That's, yeah. So the, the, um, the cell types that uh, produce uh, SAA is actually a little bit tricky. If you look at LPS as you, the classical model for inflammation, it's the macrophages that will react and produce, yeah. But for particles, it is something else. We have tried to do single cell transcriptomics, and in, in those studies, it seemed to be fibroblast cells that would uh, produce SAA in response to particles. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this depends. So the short answer is that uh, it seems that there are different cell types that, that play this role depend, depending on um, the type of particle, which is not very nice if you want to, to um, make a very robust in vitro model. Um, okay. yeah. yeah. And I had also a, a final question. Um, so yeah, you said one, on one slide that you were surprised that they had similar uh, NOAL uh, levels, different particles, but for me, it's, it's a bit, logic that when surface area is the driver and maybe not a chemical and not a mass that similar yeah. surface areas give the same response no yes no i agree um and and in a way um it gives me hope that perhaps it would be possible to be very pragmatic and then kind of try to make a, a um a, a limit that was based on on um on inert particles or particles that do not have specific toxicity. And then you could say, this is the minimal toxicity that all particles have. Then them, there will be particles that are more potent for different reasons. Yeah. Yeah. And, and my, um, to the best, yeah. I think that we have so far underestimated the health effects of these inhaled particles uh, because we, we have kind of have a tendency to say, oh, inflammation is not really an, an adverse effect. But I think that now inflammation is actually accompanied by acute phase response, which is a very adverse effect. And if we try to calculate what is the, the risk in, based on epidemiological studies, what is the, the uh, clinically or, or risk relevant increase in CRP and SAA, very small increases in these levels are associated with the risk acceptance levels that we would have for the general population or for the working environment. 
very so that's a maybe thirty percent increase or ten percent increase. And, and and an additional question because it's it's the the the, the symposium is on on mixtures. So if we mix an exposure to different particles, the total surface area. So we have to calculate them all together. Yes, that yeah. would be yes. Yeah. And in, in that way, we could take all kinds of, of, of exposures and maybe probably also other um, non-particle exposures, acid or anything that you could think uh, would, if you induce tissue injury, you will get acute phase response. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. No, no, very good. Thank you. So, so we are Thank you so much. Just, just in time, a very nice... Uh, and clear presentation and yeah, a lively, uh, yeah, not discussion, but at least Q and A uh, session. Um, so we step away from uh, the particles, and then um, we come to risk assessment of combined occupational exposure to carcinogens. Examples of hexavalent chromium, nickel, and BAHs. And so this is a presentation given by Tina Santonen. Uh, from the Finnish Institute, so it's really from Finland this time, uh, of occupational health, uh, and uh, her uh, domain of interest uh, of uh, Tina Santona is occupational toxicology, biomonitoring, and chemical risk assessment, and she's, yeah, as I said, linked to the Finnish Institute of Occupational Health, but also a member of the ECA Risk uh, Assessment Committee, and uh, many more, uh, as for instance, HBM for you, and, and so on. So, Please, uh, Tina, uh, I will stop sharing and then you can uh, put up uh, your presentation. Okay, thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Let's see if I get this uh, to work. Okay, I suppose you can see my yeah, very clear. presentation. Okay, yeah. thank you. So, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to present uh, uh, our activities, what we have made uh, actually uh, as part of uh, HPM for EU uh, project and, uh, and what we are actually uh, continuing within a uh, new uh, large uh, EU uh, initiative uh, park, uh, which is uh, for uh, which is an uh, acronym for partnership uh, of the assessment of risks of chemicals. So I will talk about the uh, approaches uh, for risk assessment of combined uh, occupational exposure to uh, carcinogens. And uh, we have been uh, working with, uh, with uh, metals, uh, specifically hexavalent chromium, nickel, uh, which are uh, carcinogenic metals and uh, PAHs, and uh, and uh, this is uh, this is to uh, present a case study uh, with which uh, we are working uh, with uh, based on uh, on the data that uh, or work that has been uh, done as part of HPM for EU uh, project. It will also consider the use of biomonitoring uh, data in the uh, uh, in the risk assessment. Okay, if we consider generally uh, the assessment of combined uh, exposure to chemicals in occupational uh, settings, uh, as you know, uh, occupational exposure limit values are usually established uh, for single uh, substances. However, uh, according to uh, occupational safety and health legislation, uh, when uh, there are two or more harmful uh, substances which uh, act upon uh, the same target organ, uh, uh, their uh, combined effects uh, rather than the, uh, that of either individually should be uh, considered. So uh, usually uh, additivity is uh, uh, assumed uh, 
in the case of uh, substances which have uh, similar uh, target tokens and uh, similar mode of uh, actions, uh, unless there are information on uh, potential uh, synergistic effects, for ex for example. And here you can see this uh, quite uh, familiar uh, sum uh, formula, uh, which is uh, related to so-called hazard index approach to uh, to uh, uh, to assess the combined uh, exposure uh, so uh, it is a simple uh, sum uh, sum summing up of uh, uh, of uh, uh, relationship uh, relationships between measured concentrations uh, and uh, and occupational uh, exposure limit values which should be uh, then uh, below uh, one uh, in occupational settings uh, this uh, has been uh, generally applied uh, but at least for example in Finland uh, it is mainly applied in the case of solvents or irritating uh, substances uh, when it can be uh, assumed that the, the critical uh, effect is the same but uh, but not uh, necessarily uh, for other uh, types of uh, combined uh, effects. Okay, this is a, a, a figure uh, just to uh, show that uh, if uh, you have uh, uh, have substances which uh, have uh, similar target organs uh, and can uh, can be considered to share the similar mode uh, of an uh, action then uh, you can assume uh, concentration uh, addition and uh, use uh, uh, this kind of hazard index uh, approach uh, where uh, then uh, if the sum uh, of uh, these uh, uh, relationships between concentrations and uh, and uh, uh, OELs exceeds uh, one uh, the exposure is considered uh, of a health concern of course if there are uh, some uh, uh, other uh, other possible uh, effects uh, 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 or uh, synergism, uh, synergism, for example, due to metabolic interactions, uh, then uh, alternative approach needs to be considered. And if, uh, for example, mode of action and uh, target tokens are uh, are uh, bit uh, are different, uh, for example, we have a carcinogen, but uh, but uh, uh, but uh, other substances causing lung cancer and other uh, leukemia, then uh, it's uh, not appropriate to make uh, this kind of uh, of uh, assumption. Okay, uh, so uh, if we have uh, two or more uh, carcinogens uh, acting through a similar kind of uh, genotoxic uh, mechanism and uh, share uh, the same target or organ, it can be assumed that they have uh, additive uh, effects and then we uh, we can uh, can uh, use uh, the uh, the uh, assumption uh, that uh, uh, that uh, there is a dose additivity and uh, and use for example this uh, hazard index uh, approach which is a, a simple approach to to consider these potential uh, combined effects However, it needs to be recognized that this might not be uh, might not fully describe the magnitude of uh, risk of uh, combined if exposure if, uh, for example, the so so shape of those responses uh, uh, different between the uh, different substances, and uh, I will uh, come more in that in uh, following uh, slides. 
and it is also uh, possible to calculate the combined cancer uh, risk at its exposure uh, level, which might give some further uh, information. Oh, okay, uh, I already referred to this uh, HPM for EU uh, project. Uh, within uh, this uh, project, uh, we uh, started this uh, work uh, related to mixture uh, risk assessment and uh, hexavalent chromium uh, nickel compounds and PAHs for, were uh, selected for a case study. Uh, the risk assessment uh, that was uh, made uh, uh, made uh, 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 within uh, this project it was based on literature data and uh, and available German tolerable uh, risk levels and dose additivity was uh, assumed. This uh, approach uh, is currently uh, further uh, developed and applied uh, for uh, the worker individual exposure uh, data that we have uh, derived uh, from uh, HPM for EU chromate uh, study. Uh, this uh, HPM for EU chromate study it uh, includes. Uh, not only air monitoring data, but also biomonitoring uh, data, which will be uh, applied in uh, in the uh, risk assessment. Okay, uh, these uh, three uh, carcinogens, uh, they are all uh, xenotoxic carcinogens. And uh, hexavalent chromium and uh, PAHs have been considered to have uh, linear uh, dose responses, uh, whereas uh, dose response of nickel compounds uh, is uh, nowadays considered to uh, to resemble uh, hockey stick uh, with uh, a threshold uh, below which uh, risk is. Uh, significantly uh, diminished, uh, but not necessarily yet uh, uh, lower to uh, zero. So, uh, so uh, nickel is, uh, uh, in this sense, a little bit uh, different from uh, these uh, two classical uh, Xenotoxic uh, carcinogens, uh, which uh, are considered this kind of as uh, this kind of direct uh, direct uh, xenotoxic uh, agents. Okay, we have uh, existing uh, dose responses for uh, for uh, hexavalent chromium uh, nickel compounds uh, and uh, BAHs. Uh, and uh, here you can see uh, those responses that has been uh, calculated in uh, in uh, recent evaluations. Uh, first of all, by uh, by uh, ECHAS risk assessment committee related to uh, to uh, hexavalent chromium and. Uh, uh, PAH uh, exposure and uh, this uh, this uh, uh, nickel dose response have been uh, derived by uh, German ATS, but actually uh, the same uh, similar uh, kind of uh, approach uh, has been uh, used also by uh, by uh, ECAS risk assessment committee. Uh, <coughs> In the case of uh, case of uh, uh, BAH uh, exposure, as you can uh, see, uh, uh, there are uh, lung cancer risk has been uh, derived uh, as uh, as uh, in has been uh, calculated for uh, concentration of uh, benzoapyrene uh, in that uh, BAH uh, mixture 
of course, as you know, uh, PAHs are uh, are occurring uh, always as uh, as mixtures of uh, of hundreds of uh, of compounds and uh, P uh, benzoyl pyrene is uh, representing a, a, a such kind of indicator uh, substance for which uh, which. Uh, uh, uh cancer uh risk uh, can be uh, related and it has been uh, it has been uh, selected as uh, this kind of uh, indicator uh, substance because uh, uh, most epidemiological studies which uh, describe uh, cancer risk uh, among uh, BAH uh, exposed uh, workers uh, have uh, provided exposure uh, estimates in those uh, tasks uh, in relation to uh, benzoapyrene uh, concentrations. So, uh, as uh, I already indicated, uh, nickel. Uh, is uh, having a bit uh, a different uh, uh, dose response, uh, so it is uh, it is not uh, uh, it is not considered to be uh, be linear, but it is considered to uh, have uh, this kind of uh, uh, threshold. Uh, level uh, below uh, which uh, risk uh, is uh, is uh, lowered uh, so the slope is uh, changing uh, below this uh, this uh, threshold uh, value uh, one issue that needs to be also noted uh, when uh, these uh, cancer risk estimates are used uh, is that uh, uh, for a hexavalent chromium, the dose response is made for inhalable uh, fraction, inhalable uh, uh, chromium, uh, whereas uh, in, in nickel case, dose response is uh, for res respirable uh, fraction. And this is because uh, nickel uh, dose response has been uh, derived on the basis of animal car carcinogenicity uh, data, uh, which uh, has uh, used uh, particles uh, which are uh, in the respirable uh, range, uh, whereas uh, hexavalent chromium uh, like uh, like uh, BAH uh, uh, dose response, uh, it is based on based on uh, epidemiological uh, data, uh, which uh, uh, expresses uh, the exposure levels as uh, as inhalable. Uh, inhalable uh, chromium uh, 6. Okay, uh, the approach uh, that we have uh, used for a uh, combined uh, risk assessment is uh, to use uh, uh, such kind of uh, tolerable calculated uh, uh, risk uh, levels and, uh, and then uh, uh, use this uh, hazard index uh, approach. For example, uh, in e EU, uh, quite recently, it has been agreed uh, that uh, that four extra cancers uh, per uh, thousand workers uh, presents uh, such kind of tolerable cancer risk level, which is um, uh, the uh, yeah, sort of maximum accepted uh, extra cancer uh, level that uh, that uh, that should be applied in uh, Europe when, uh, for example, setting uh, occupational uh, occupational exposure limit values. 
this uh, approach is based on the uh, on the approach that has been applied in Germany uh, for uh, some years uh, already. Uh, in Germany, uh, they have also defined so-called acceptable cancer uh, risk levels, uh, which uh, uh, which was uh, form, uh, f earlier uh, for extra cancers per, per uh, 10,000 uh, workers and uh, was uh, later on uh, changed that uh, as uh, for uh, per uh, 100,000 uh, workers. So uh, if we consider those uh, cancer uh, dose responses, uh, if uh, we apply this uh, for extra cancers per uh, thousand uh, workers as uh, as uh, uh, tolerable uh, risk levels risk level this uh, uh, would mean uh, following oels for these uh, compounds uh, so uh, for a chromium uh, hexavalent chromium it means uh, one microgram micrograms per cubic meter for nickel compounds 13 micrograms per cubic meter and for PAH is uh, as uh, benzoapyrene as an uh, indicator substance, uh, uh, 0.7 uh, micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, if we take uh, then, for example, welding, where we have uh, both, uh, at least both chromium and uh, nickel uh, exposure, uh, we can uh, we can uh, calculate uh, the combined uh, risk uh, in HBM4 EU chromate study. We measured hexavalent chromium air levels uh, of uh, of 0 0.5 uh, micrograms per cubic meter, uh, which was a median uh, level uh, and uh, P95 uh, level was uh, 4 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, we are currently uh, analyzing uh, nickel air measurement uh, uh, statistics. Uh, so it's uh, not fully available yet, but for example, if we uh, consider uh, the uh, Finnish uh, welders uh, subset of that uh, data uh, median uh, nickel uh, level for respirable fraction was uh, one micrograms per cubic meter, with uh, P95 uh, being uh, 42 micrograms per cubic meter. So uh, if we calculate hazard index uh, based on these uh, levels uh, we uh, we will get uh, get uh, risks uh, varying from 0.58 uh, to uh, 7 uh, and 7 is uh, yeah uh, clearly above that uh, one uh, which uh, which uh, is uh, is uh, uh, the uh, hazard index uh, uh, limit for uh, for a concern, and if we uh, look at that uh, that where that uh, seven uh, comes from, uh, a little bit more than for uh, than half of it uh, comes from uh, hexavalent chromium exposure and the uh, rest. Uh, from uh, from nickel exposure, whereas in the case of median uh, levels, uh, uh, mostly uh, hexavalent chromium uh, is uh, having an impact on uh, on uh, on the combined uh, risk. Uh, this is uh, probably uh, better illustrated in uh, illustrated when. Uh, when you calculate uh, extra cancer uh, risks uh, for uh, for these uh, individual uh, compounds, uh, because this uh, hazard index approach uh, that was presented uh, may not uh, 
fully uh, consider this uh, non-linearity of the dose response of uh, nickel. So, uh, so if we look at the combined uh, extra cancer risk at the exposure uh, levels presented uh, in the previous uh, slide at uh, median uh, air levels of uh, uh, chromium-6 and uh, uh, nickel, uh, we can see that uh, it is uh, indeed mainly, uh, mainly uh, chromium uh, exposure that is causing uh, uh, causing uh, increased uh, uh, cancer uh, risk. Uh, so uh, there is uh, quite a big uh, difference between the uh, the extra cancer risk uh, caused by uh, caused by hexavalent chromium expose, exposure when compared to uh, to nickel uh, nickel uh, uh, compounds but then uh, if we uh, consider those uh, those uh, air levels that were uh, were uh, representing uh, p95 uh, levels there we uh, can see that uh, actually uh, nickel uh, compounds may uh, may uh, cause even uh, even uh, more uh, significant impact on uh, on the total uh, risk uh, total cancer risk uh, in these uh, workers who are exposed to uh, to uh, both uh, these uh, compounds so uh, so overall at uh, at the lower uh, nickel uh, uh, and chromium uh, levels uh, hexavalent chromium is the main component uh, affecting the risk but uh, but uh, at the higher uh, levels uh, uh, at the uh, nickel levels, which are above uh, that uh, break uh, point, nickel may uh, may play a significant role in combined uh, risk, and this is indeed uh, due to uh, to this uh, uh, non-linearity of uh, nickel uh, dose response. Okay, um, yeah, sorry. So uh, we also uh, were uh, have been and are using uh, biomonitoring uh, data uh, for the uh, calculation of combined uh, exposure and uh, risk. Uh, so uh, so in our earlier paper uh, we uh, used uh, biomonitoring data and this is also uh, used in our current analyses uh, when uh, we, when we, we can perform combined risk assessment using uh, worker individual exposure uh, data from this uh, HBM for EU uh, chromate study benefit of the biomonitoring data is of course that it considers the impact of the respiratory uh, protection uh, many of the workers uh, uh, used uh, respiratory protection and the air measurements were generally generally made outside uh, the uh, respiratory protective equipment uh, th however, the use of uh, biomonitoring data uh, brings some uh, additional uh, challenges, which are mainly related to a characterization of the re relationship of biomarker levels and external uh, exposure and uh, and uh, following risk uh, levels. There are uh, correlations established uh, if we consider these uh, substances. There are correlations established between biomarker levels and expo external exposure and uh, risk uh, levels. Uh, for uh, uh, for uh, hexavalent chromium, uh, we have uh, uh, published uh, some uh, new uh, correlation data between 
between urinary chromium uh, levels and uh, and uh, inhalable hexavalent uh, chromium uh, levels. Those correlations are pretty good for soluble uh, uh, chromates, uh, uh, but uh, not uh, not actually so good uh, for less uh, soluble uh, chromates. Uh, although uh, for uh, welders uh, who are exposed to uh, chromium uh, oxides uh, there are there are uh, some correlations available also in the case of uh, nickel correlations vary uh, depending on uh, solubility of nickel comp compounds and the air levels at the breakpoint level may not uh, really uh, result in a significant elevation of uh, urinary nickel levels above the general population background uh, levels. Uh, so uh, and available correlations have been established mainly for uh, soluble nickel. In the case of uh, PAH is uh, one additional challenge is uh, related to the fact that the mo uh, most commonly used biomarker uh, for uh, for PAH uh, exposure is uh, hydroxy uh, benzo uh, uh, pyrene, uh, which uh, is uh, a metabolite of pyrene and uh, in uh, uh, depending of PAH uh, mixture, uh, the relationship uh, between mm, benzoapyrene and, uh, and pyrene may uh, differ. Uh, so this uh, may or brings some, uh, some uh, answer, additional uncertainty uh, when we are dealing with uh, biomonitoring data, although uh, there are pretty uh, good uh, correlations established between bit, between benzoapyrene air levels and uh, hydroxypyrene uh, uh, urinary levels. Uh, if we look at the uh, Welder's uh, data from a uh, chromate study, uh, we, uh, we can see that uh, that uh, B95 uh, urinary chromium levels uh, were in that study uh, around uh, two micrograms per gram creatinine, uh, which suggests uh, exposure to 2.5 micrograms per cubic meter, uh, which uh, corresponds a risk level of uh, 10 uh, extra cancers per. Uh, thousand workers, whereas B95 uh, urinary nickel le levels were uh, around five micrograms per gram creatinine, which was actually quite close to to uh, control levels, uh, suggesting that exposure to nickel was uh, in this this. Uh, uh, workers upset uh, quite low, close or uh, below the breakpoint level uh, of uh, six micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, if you compare to, uh, to that, uh, uh, that risk assessment uh, based, uh, which was based on air levels, uh, this, uh, this uh, so it's quite different uh, results and uh, and uh, may reflect uh, the uh, the impact of uh, respiratory protective equipment and uh, and uh, effectivity of the uh, respiratory uh, pro protecting protection since uh, based on this uh, this uh, analysis uh, it seems uh, that uh, hexavalent chromium may be the main constituent affecting the risk uh, in these uh, workers. We are, however, uh, still working with the data and, uh, and uh, more refined analyses are, uh, are to be made. And uh, naturally, as part of this, uh, this uh, analysis, uh, one important issue is to consider uh, 
uncertainties related to uh, approaches uh, related to this approach, uh, which uh, indeed need to be re uh, recognized and uh, considered. There are also uh, related to PAHs uh, in a Portuguese subset of uh, chrome surface treatment workers. Uh, there were co-exposure not only to hexavalent chromium and nickel but also uh, to uh, BAHs. Uh, so risk assessment using this data is currently uh, per performed, taking also BAH exposure into account. And uh, this uh, data set contains also individual biomonitoring uh, data, so we can uh, really go for individual uh, risk uh, assessment. Uh, this uh, combined individual risk uh, can be then also compared to individual effect marker levels that we uh, have measured uh, these in these workers. And uh, here you can see uh, some overall uh, results uh, which have been uh, published uh, last year in a paper of Tavares et al. Uh, or on the effect marker uh, levels of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, HP, uh, HPM4 uh, EU uh, chromate uh, study uh, workers. And as you can see, there were in some, uh, some worker groups uh, increased uh, levels of either uh, blood uh, uh, lymph lymphocyte micronuclei or reticulocyte uh, micronuclei. And the uh, main uh, interesting question is uh, whether, uh, uh, whether it is uh, combined exposure or whether it is mainly chromium uh, 6, which uh, is affecting uh, these uh, effect marker uh, results in uh, in different uh, different uh, uh, worker uh, groups, and that is something what we are uh, we are uh, currently uh, analyzing in uh, in the different uh, uh, populations that were uh, worker populations that were uh, may, studied. May, may I? Ah. <laughs> May I ask you to wrap up because okay, you're really you. coming to the end. Yeah. So sorry, yeah, but you may finalize your, your talk for sure. So so sorry, but uh, I, I did not have a view uh, where you were in your presentation. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Uh, that was the uh, last slide. So uh, thank you. And here you can see the uh, study group. Yeah, very well. Thank you very much for uh, the clear presentation of the risk on, on, on cancer and, and the additive risk uh, of the yeah, genotoxic uh, compounds. So, so if I understand right, so, so the, the, the genotoxic risk of the compounds really make the, the more or less similar uh, mode of action. And that then uh, makes it possible to make kind of additive risk assessment of, of those. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you look at yeah the, the real exposure levels that as you've shown uh, for, for the different three different compounds, uh, the P50, I'm, I'm uh, okay with that uh, looking at that, but but I'm a bit um, worried when I see the P95 mm -hmm. um, data. It's a huge increase eh, because yep. to be honest, uh, an extra uh, of four cancers per thousand workers is, is already not very, very strict to my feeling because it, it's a yeah. relatively high risk. And yeah, then having right. these, these numbers going so sky high is yeah. worrying, really. Yeah, indeed, indeed, uh, that's uh, true. And uh, it was uh, mainly affected that the, that the, uh, or is mainly affected then uh, by uh, nickel, which uh, uh, slope is uh, uh, steeper at uh, at those uh, those uh, those levels, which uh, ex exceed uh, that breakpoint uh, level. 
but uh, yes, uh, as uh, as I said, uh, those uh, data uh, were not uh, representing uh, the whole uh, whole uh, population. So we are still uh, analyzing that uh, that uh, uh, nickel data. So it was just an example, and uh, and and. Uh, 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 it uh, uh, did not take into account in uh, the effect of uh, respiratory protection <laughs> and uh, that's uh, when no, you that's looked true. Then, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah when you then looked at uh, the biomonitoring data actually uh, it uh, uh, it showed uh, a quite different picture so no, no, that's, uh, that's true yeah so, so sorry uh but I see also that Ula has her hand raised, so she has maybe a short question because we have to... Very short, uh, yeah. So so you have the this assumption of additivity. Yeah. But I thought, you know, asbestos and, and smoking, there you see yeah. synergism. Indeed. Do you have any yeah, indication yeah. of synergism or...? Uh, I don't think uh, there isn't really data. To show uh, uh, synergistic uh, effects, yeah, uh, between these uh, substances. So, uh, but of course, uh, additivity is a default uh, assumption. Uh, as long as we don't have uh, better uh, or other uh, data to argue against that. Thank you. Okay. Very interesting. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so sorry to to stop here the discussion, but um, I I think um, for sake of time we have also to to proceed, um, and I guess that when there are questions, we may send you an email with these questions, uh, Tina. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, uh, so. Then we come to our third speaker uh, about REACH 2.0. Uh, can Am I the only one who lost the connection? No, I also yeah. lost the connection to Peter. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, I think uh, we lost Peter. So in that case, um, I I think uh, we can continue, I suppose. Yes, but uh, I cannot share my screen because he's sharing his. Um, I can check if. Okay. Ah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. OK, fine. Sorry for the issues with the connection. Yeah, no problem. No, no, but uh, probably you took over, Manosic. And uh, in... yeah, well, your connection got lost, so Violin is now sharing her screen. If that's okay, yeah, that's very good. So yeah, I'm sorry. No problem. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe just to conclude the day, um, we we heard a lot about um combined mixtures, and you know that in the EU we have that reach legislation that is currently under review. And the whole question that I, I wanted to address in, in the last minutes of the day is whether REACH 2.0, so the new REACH, will be able to tackle actually that toxicological challenge of combined exposure. The way um, the Commission is proposing to do that is with a mixture allocation factor or assessment factor um, that should come into force from 2025, 2026 onwards, depending on the on the timing of the REACH review. But um, this is a bit what I would like to, to present. So a bit of regulatory spices um, on the science that we just heard. And maybe because some of you may still not be exposed to REACH, um, I would like to give you a little bit of regulatory background, then explain what that famous math is and how we as industry will see that in terms of impacts. What does it mean in practice in terms of what we have today as information of what we would need to generate as information and what are possible ways forward? And on the latter, I have to confess, I will focus mainly on the metals, but uh, we heard already a lot about metals today, but it's also because we have some specificities I would like to, to explain here. So 
um, starting with a bit of regulatory background. Um, you know that, or you may not know, but in practice, in the systems that we um, have been implementing over the world to regulate chemicals, usually we are working on uh, chemicals by chemical basis, so one substance at a time. And there is a reason for that, a kind of reason of um, simplicity um, also in the assessment. And when I'm talking about simplicity, well, it's just to basically be a bit realistic with the amount of work that one risk assessment of one substance is asking for. So normally what we do in regulations is to set safe exposure levels um, for chemicals. And if you work substance by substance, actually you make a kind of assumption that your chemical is arriving into what we call the pristine location. So without other chemicals being it in the body or the environment. And so what um, we are doing usually is um, really to, to work um, on the exposure of individual chemicals and um, considering one uh, single source. So for example, in REACH, which is the EU legislation to do risk assessment, if you want for one substance to have access to the market, you need to demonstrate that actually the substance can be safely used. How do you do that? You calculate what we call a risk characterization ratio or an RCA, which is basically simply the ratio between the exposure and the effects. So logically, you have a, an idea about the exposure to your chemical. You also know at which concentrations you will see effects. Well, if you compare the exposure versus the effects, if the exposure is lower than the concentration that will generate effect, your risk is controlled. If it's not the case, your risk is not controlled. So this is what we do um, in REACH. It's an RCR. Of course, REACH is not the only piece of legislation, but um, in practice, this is how we demonstrate safe use. And that's compiled in what industry calls registration dossiers. So basically, the, the, the information that you need to provide to authorities to be able to access to the market. Now, um, for a long time, and I'm talking here about toxicologists, ecotox, but also people who are doing risk assessment, authorities, and society. Um, well, basically, we have looked at those systems one by one, substance by substance. Um, and then we considered that the fact that you had a mixture, well, basically, you could put that more or less aside as long as the exposures to all the single chemicals that you were looking at in a cocktail, in a mixture, were below those um, levels judged to be safe. So basically what we did was risk assessment substance by substance. And then, well, we knew that, of course, the substances would come together somehow in a mixture. But as long as all exposures were low enough, well, we didn't really address in the regulatory view um, those mixtures. However, um, there was still growing recognition also over time that actually, um, well, that exposure to a cocktail may also um, generate some chemical risks that would not be captured by your risk assessment substance by substance. And you see here on the right side of the slide, you see actually a, an extract from a publication in 94, which is already some time ago, where basically there was already some interaction. So at least the effect of a combination of um, chemicals that was evoked. And I, I put you here two statements of basically the discussion that we had over the years is that, first of all, we all realize that chemicals pollution, it's not substance by substance. Actually, we have a lot of mixtures around us that may com be composed of hundreds of chemicals, but also um, we could have some toxicity even if all the chemicals are present at concentrations below the effect level. So that's really something that was um, well more and more reported, um, more and more stressed also, uh, a request from society to address that. And that's um, basically what, what will happen now in REACH.2. Now, again, I, I, just to, to illustrate that a little bit more in risk terms, so what I told you is that when you have a substance, basically you, you use a risk characterization ratio comparing 
effect and exposure, which you know, if you present it a bit differently, means that you need to have a risk characterization ratio that's below one or maximum equal to one, so that the exposure is below the effect. So for a substance, you use the RCR as a yardstick. That's the formula that you see at the, on top of the slides. Now, if you take a mixture with several, um, for example, N kind of constituents, well, if you look at the combined toxicity, and this is also what we, we just heard, using the concentration addition, so the addition as a kind of default, well, then you will have a sum of those RCRs. And actually, your mixture will be safe if the sum is still below or equal to one. Again, I mean, this is a theory. Now, what we saw is that a number of databases, in particular in the environment, showed that basically um, this was not the case, that actually you had a kind of accumulation of um, the RCRs, and that was and that this accumulation were really exceeding that value of one. And one of the most famous examples in that discussion is shown here below um, on the slide. It's a, it's a mix of um, pesticide substances, and basically you see that the RCRs are accumulating and that, of course, you exceed um, the one, so that the overall um, situation that you have in the environment, because here it's water-based, it's about monitoring in the environment, well, actually um, was not respecting that safe level of below one. So um, going back then to what the regulators want to do, well, then the, um, the paradigm now to try to address combined toxicity is to say, well, every component of a mixture will contribute to the combination effect in proportion to its concentration and dose and its potency and toxicity, even when each constituent is present at levels below its effect threshold. So we are moving really from, well, considering that putting that slightly aside to now really postulating that basically um, every mixture comp component will contribute and that you need to do something about it. But it means also that the way we were doing risk assessment by going substance by substance, controlling just the risk of individual chemicals, actually it's not sufficient um, to ensure that the risk of combined exposure is acceptable, so below one. And hence the overall strategy uh, in terms of risk assessment, but even more important in terms of risk management needs to be adapted to to consider that combined exposure. Now, is that completely new? Um, yes and no. I mean, clearly in REACH it will be something new, but in other cases, um, there were already some attempts to consider mixtures um, as a whole in assessments. For example, when you're talking about intentional mixtures like biocides or plant protection products, but those are really formulated products where basically you know what you're putting in the mixture. So you do your assessment, but of course you take into account um, the effects of the formula. Now, there was also some focus in on intentional mixtures. So what you may be confronted with in some parts of the environmental legislation, when you look at water, being it fresh water or marine water, um, air or soil, where basically you have to look at the good status of the environmental bodies. Also, um, I mean, uh, REACH still was not addressing really combined exposure, but the EU Commission was quite well aware about um, the concern. They had a publication in 2012. The WHO as well um, started to reflect about the, uh, the risk assessment scheme for um, that kind of combined exposure. And if you have some time, I would certainly recommend the publication by the OECD in 2018, which is providing you really a kind of framework to reflect about the mixture risk assessment and the questions to be posed. So again, all this a bit of background, it was existing, but what really what happened really then to, to put that in reach 2.0? Well, um, you know that in the EU, we have the Green Deal, which brings together a number of objectives to, to meet the twin transition and the climate and the digital transition. 
and you have that visual on the right part of the screen where you have a number of blocks that are part of the Green Deal. And the block on the right part of the, on top of that visual is about zero pollution ambition for a toxic free environment. And this is a quite important block because it's really influencing now the way we are handling chemicals. And the idea of course is to reduce the, uh, the toxic footprint that we have in our environment. And of course, it's not only about substances, but it's also about mixtures and in particular, unintentional mixtures. So the commission in 2020 committed basically to, to really work on those combined exposures on unintentional mixtures. And they said that they would put in the risk assessment equation, a kind of mixture assessment factor to consider this. And that mixture allocation factor or mixture assessment factor, I mean, the name has been changing also, um, is really a way they wanted to propose a kind of pragmatic tool to be able to take into account potential mixtures risks um, during the risk and the safety assessment of individual chemicals. So in other words, what I wanted to do is, well, they realized that I could not change completely the whole way risk assessment and risk management is done at this moment, substance by substance, but I wanted to add a fact on that to take into account the mixtures. And that was that famous math mixture assessment or mixture allocation factor. Now, what is it um, exactly? Actually, it's a, a numerical value. If you have already been doing some risk assessments, um, being it under reach or elsewhere, you know that when you have some uncertainty uh, and you're comparing exposure and effects, you can modulate your uncertainty by bringing in some assessment factors or um, uncertainty factors. Well, the math is also a factor that you would apply. It's not exactly the same as an assessment factor for the uncertainty of the substance, but basically it considers the fact that you also are not in a pristine environment and that you may have mixtures effects. Now, the idea was to apply the math on the RCR. So basically you would divide your RCR bar by a numerical value, and this would be valid for the workers at the workplace, for the environmental compartments, for the general population exposed, for example, um, via air, um, the environment, etc., but also for the consumer. So, so really, um, when you would do your assessment substance by substance, you would add that mixture factor um, to consider those unintentional mixtures. Now, why is it proposed and presented as a kind of pragmatic tool? Because we know that there is a lot of science about mixtures. And here, basically, what we do is simply divide an RCR by a value. You may consider that a bit as a shortcut. Of course, if you had a lot of data about the mixtures that were occurring in the environment, we would be able to use the science and the data as such. But we will never have the whole science, the whole data set to be able to address all the mixtures and all the possible combinations in the environment. So basically, the commission had to come with a kind of easy way to address unintentional um, mixtures, and um, they used a number. They, they really stated very clearly, and that's correct, that the people who are putting their substance on the market, well, they, they mainly are responsible for their substance, so they will not look at other substances. They do not know neither about, well, they have some information about how the substances is used, but if you have some competitors in industry, well, you have less information. So th there is not a lot of knowledge. And they're not, well, they're supposed to know exactly how the substance is used, but we realize that the communication with downstream users is not always optimal. So you don't know always how the substance is used in other workplaces how people are exposed around the plants, how consumers are exposed. So there is a lot of unknown there. And that's why they wanted to have something that would be pragmatic, that could be applied, even if you don't have all the knowledge. They presented it though as a kind of default. Again, I mean, if you have the science, if you have a specific risk assessment for a mixture, well, um, you're, of course, uh, most, more than welcome to use that science. Um, that's, that's also the case, for example, for 
the workplace um, where under the chemical agents directive, which is a, a legislation for, for the workers, for the, um, for the workplace, well, where you have that kind of assessments that, that are done um, because the people know what's at the workplace. So if you have some data, if you have knowledge on the mixtures, that's fine. But if it's not the case, uh, and that's often the case because we lack data, then you have to rely on the math. So um, did industry like that idea? Not at all, of course. And I will explain a little bit where they see some impacts. However, I think all um, industry people recognize that that aspect of mixture need to be tackled on one way or the other. Now, I, I, what is quite interesting also in the evolution of all the discussions that we had with the member states, uh, with the scientists, with, uh, with the authorities, is that there has been evolution also in the way to, to really use that factor. So the idea is really, um, again, to, to consider that, well, you don't uh, put a substance in a pristine environment, being it the, the body or the, um, an environmental compartment like water. No, basically, um, that environment, your body has a kind of tolerance for toxic stress and basically a number of things are added and basically challenge the tolerance of that environment. And hence, um, you need to avoid to fill completely the cup, but you need to consider what is coming together in the cup. So um, to reflect that aspect of you know, filling a risk up, um, the, the name was changed from mixture assessment factor to mixture allocation factor, because it's really about considering the different contributions to the cup. The idea is really to, to manage the risk. It's not for the beauty of the risk assessment at the end of the day is to be able to take some decisions about what is too much for the cup or what is still acceptable. The, um, the value that is proposed, so that number that will basically uh, be used to divide the RCR is um, currently five to be, to be confirmed. Um, but again, you can, it's a default, you can deviate if you have a specific risk assessment. And I spare you the details of the tonnage, but it's mainly for substances that are widely used and that you will have more chances to, to meet, of course, in those uh, mixtures. Now, um, what do you do with that math? Um, you divide your RCR and probably that um, you may have a, an issue there uh, not being compliant. So what, what can you do basically if you realize that by dividing the math, well, you're no more compliant. In other words, that your risk characterization ratio is above uh, one. Well, you can refine what you have. I mean, again, the, the equation of the RCR is compares effects and exposure. You could try to refine both the hazards, so the effect or the exposure by having more test data, by having more measurements uh, that are maybe more refined than model data. But the, the, the main thing is also, if you cannot refine your RCR, well, then you need to reduce exposure. You need to reduce the contribution to the cup. And you have to propose risk management measures. And if it's not feasible, you may have to stop one use. So, and that's why it's such a risk management tool. Now, um, I told you industry, I'm just checking time, yeah, industry was not super, super happy. Um, they, they saw a lot of impacts. Um, basically, um, this was also evaluated then in, uh, in a number of studies um, done by the consultants for the commission, but also consultants for the different industry sector. Um, this is, I just show you one scheme. Basically, the, the people realized that by applying a math, they would have to update their reach files. Again, may seem to be a detail, but actually it requires um, quite some work. So, I mean, the impacts, the costs of such a, a measure proposed in REACH 2.2 were tried, were estimated basically um, to see what would be feasible and what would be acceptable. We did the same for the metals. Um, and actually we saw that um, for the metals, if we had a math of 10, which was a proposed value at the start, actually uh, basically all our dossiers would have to be updated. Um, well, you see that in different ways for the workplace or the environment, but so overall to keep uh, the story short, there was impact of that proposed measure and that impact was discussed with member states and the commission. Now, what are the ways forward? Um, 
and here again, I mean, just pausing a second on the metals, um, because we an issue with the metals, especially if you look at um, mixture exposure, is that um, metals are naturally occurring substances, plus they have been emitted in the environment, but overall we have, a, a, we have background values in the environment, meaning that basically even without, imagine without no human activity, you would have already some metals um, in the environmental compartments. And we did the exercise um, by just taking the background concentrations of metals, calculating an RCR, then adding basically what you could find together in mines or in water or um, in the marine environment. And we basically already exceeded that RCR of one. Um, so we had already an issue when we had to sum that up. We have also some metals that are essential and we didn't know how to consider that in this context because actually when you have an essential metals, you cannot go that as low as possible because otherwise you will have other effects. Also for the metals, actually for most metals, not all, we have a, a huge number of data. So generating more data would not help a lot. And the same we are measuring and actually it's an asset, but in this context, well, you cannot refine so much on the exposure. So of course, then the possibilities of refinement and iterations remain, well, you propose more risk management measure if your LCR is above one or you stop uses, but to be able to do that and to justify that, of course, you need to be sure that the assumptions are correct. And one of the key ones for the metals is to be sure that actually the, the default concentration additional approach um, is the, the right one. Now, it's easy to complain um, rather than complaining what we did on the environment was to launch a, a huge scientific program to, to try to tackle those issues of the math and try to understand basically what's happening when those with unintentional mixtures. This is a meat program. If you have some questions about it, don't hesitate to contact me. But basically what we did um, was to, besides confirming that um, math would have impacts, is to try to identify, for example, in the, in the aquatic compartment, which are the metals that matter the most, are the contributing the, more to the, the most to the cup. And that we base that on an, a huge exercise uh, done on measured data. Then we also, because we were complaining about the background that needs to be considered in the math, uh, we did a review on what we know on the background. So really to basically be able to support the scientific discussion. But then um, we, we started to look at um, what, we, what is known about basically the combined toxicity, combined exposure for metals, metals but not here only metals, metals, because you could have metals co-occurring co -occurring with pesticides or organic substances. So we did a, a literature review to have an idea about the knowledge. And we also started to design a testing phase. And that's what we are doing now. We are testing the metals that matter the most uh, with organics that, mat that matter the most. Again, that are really the most at risk in those mixtures and we will have those results in the coming year and a half. So for the workers, again, I mean, keeping it short, I mean, clearly there are some assessments done at the workplace. Um, exposures are usually identified. For the metals, again, we cannot um, improve a lot of things at the level of the effect side because usually we, we have some data. Um, we can work on refining exposure when we don't have much measured data. We can use biomonitoring, as mentioned by Tina. Um, but clearly, um, what is still on the discussion now is, well, if you have a specific risk assessment, you don't apply a math. So to conclude, um, well, REACH 2.0 and the exact timing of REACH is still to be defined, but we may have a legal proposal by end of the year in that new text that will be then discussed by the EU institution and implemented if everything goes well in 26, 27, well, we will have a new factor to take into account um, unintentional mixtures and solve that long pending question posed by toxicologists, risk assessors and society. Uh, it may be a simple numeric value of five as a default for all possible reach endpoints, but you may have a derogation if you have a specific risk assessment or if you have a good argumentation like we try to have on the metals. Again, we can have a refinement, but this is, needs to be anticipated at, as it requires some time. 
and data. And I think, yeah, Peter, that's that's it on my side. Okay, thank you. Uh, very nice and clear, um, although very complex. <laughs> that's the thing. Um, yeah, I did not really work with with, with this math factor, um, and I, I see the the um, the pro of having a, a one factor, or, or maybe depending on situation, maybe two uh, or a bit uh, expert adjustment, but. As I understand, the choice of these five or whatever it will be at the end is not linked because I was wondering on that. It's not linked on the amount of different compounds in the mixture because if you could think of a simple mixture of three compared to a mixture of 20 compounds, there you would maybe need a different math, but that seems not to be true. No, and again, it's because we, we lack data. If we were able to model all those the type of mixtures, probably we would have something more informed. But it's, that's why it's really a default. It will be reviewed, though. I mean, there is a review clause because experience will be uh, increasing, and the idea is really to keep it, to be sure that five is enough. I mean, yeah. values of 100 and 200 have been proposed as well, so we need to consider that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. And... So I have a look to my uh, box if I find it, uh, Q&A. I don't see a question popping up. Um, so, yeah, and I see also the data in, 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 in the experiment that, that you were showing but still need to, to analyze. Uh, and there, yeah, you... I did not understand everything uh, or, or could read. So, but there you were working also with with a, a math factor of two, if I understand, or, or did I see that wrongly? Yeah, actually, at the beginning it was not clear whether it would be two, three, five, ten. So we investigated the impacts of different values of the math. But it seems now, uh, from well, on the commission side, that it will be a five. Yeah, but, so it's yeah something that's between one. if I understand, or yeah. yeah. Yeah, because it will be yeah really yeah something new to introduce when doing a risk assessment and and as you said it has an yeah for dossiers it, it is an extra factor and so all dossiers needs to be added up with with this yeah. data and so on so that makes it quite complex. Yeah. I see that at the moment there are no additional questions and I oh I see I have Ula yeah just very shortly. So, uh, as I understand it, it's kind of an attempt to just pragmatically solve the ad additional effects of, of combined exposures like we have in the work environment where Tina showed all these very complicated um, additive effects where you kind of have to say you use so much of one OEL and so much of the other. So here you're just being very pragmatic and then you say there are these five that need to share. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> yeah, let's see. For the workplace, it's still on the on the discussion whether actually um, the math is a better solution than a specific risk assessment. I mean, Stephen Verpal is on the line. I can tell you he would certainly plead for the assessment of the uh, what you have at the workplace itself. Um, but certainly for the environment and consumers, I mean, the, the math of five would be an easier solution. Yeah. 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 And I've got a question now in, in the Q&A, so, so thank you for your presentation. You are uh, referred to derogation. Is it possible to give an example on that? Well, the, the, the derogation for the workplace would be one. So if you have really a specific risk assessment for the workplace, you would be you would not have to apply basically your, your math of five for the workplace for your substance. Uh, mm -hmm. But as what we tried, for example, with the metals is not to have a derogation, but to have a, a refined value based on the science that we have. Yeah. So if you have better data, you don't need to follow yeah. the law. Yeah. yeah. Okay. A final question from Tina, because I think that's an old hand from Ula. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I was... Uh... Yeah, uh, just to comment uh, workplace situation. I think uh, even though the, it is uh, in legislation that the combined risk uh, risks uh, should be uh, considered and assessed uh, using, for example, a hazard index approach at uh, workplaces. 
uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, I think the issue is uh, that uh, it uh, might not be so often uh, done. Uh, so uh, it's not uh, easy. Uh, it uh, <laughs> needs quite a lot of expertise to uh, identify those uh, mixtures. So, uh, of course, uh, that uh, would be also quite pragmatic solution for <laughs> for workplace uh, places as well. But on the other hand, at work workplaces, uh, the situation is uh, sort of uh, uh, more controlled uh, when you. Uh, at least in principle, you should uh, know what are those uh, uh, those uh, components of the mixtures. Whereas, uh, as in general life, uh, uh, that's uh, the number of uh, of uh, potential compounds is so huge. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I can only agree. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, then I think. Um, uh, I see very lost, and then, then we really stop. Eh? Um, last question in the Q&A. Will MAF tackle uh, with UVCB uh, substances? And do we have a biomonitoring program in place at workplace to, to assess? I think those are two suggestions for way forwards and for further work. So definitely, yeah. uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for the question, but uh, but clearly UVCB is a, is a big question how, how to tackle that. Well, and without going into details of how it works, and and biomonitoring for me is I'm, I'm quite convinced by it, but it's a, a a way forward. But further work is needed there. Okay, so thank you very much, all uh, speakers, so Viola, Tina, Ula, uh, and certainly the audience, uh, uh, and. and yeah, it was quite a good audience. I saw the numbers on my screen somewhere. Um, and also, yeah, the, the local support of Vivi uh, Manosic. Uh, and um, certainly, uh, I thank all our contributions in the project, Exilius. Uh, I cannot name them, uh, but you can read them here. Uh, and yeah, I think uh, we will organize a next symposium, but the date is not fixed, but at least uh, one uh, in the first half of next year. So thank you very much. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. At least I learned a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.